we're going to put on a wee disclaimer. Just to say, we weren't the perfect parents. And in fact, we used to joke with our boys to say that when they turned 21, we were giving them a bursary to go and see a psychologist to sort of set up right. Okay, so we weren't the perfect parents all the time. Parenting is hard, there's no doubt about it. And for all the books out there to help us, the reality is every child is so different. And you have to just do your best. So please, this morning, um, not that we're feeling the pressure in any way this morning, but just to say, look, um, there is no perfect way of this. And, um, but we can, in church, I believe, help and support and encourage each other. So my journey, I was brought up in a one-parent family, but I can thank God for a godly mother and a godly grandmother, just like Timothy of old. Um, I had two amazing special women in my life that I wish I still had today, but I know that someday I will see them again in glory. And they really encouraged me as a child to know Jesus and to love Jesus. And we were very much encouraged to go to kids' church, Sunday school, all of those things. Um, but when I came about high school age, 13, round about that age, uh, which was a significant year for me because I was baptised in water and the Holy Spirit. And um, but from then on, and I suppose, um, I really started to take my faith on for myself and um, started to walk, but always in the background. I am very, very thankful for Godly Mother and Grandmother who really encouraged me on um, massively in the things of God. Uh, my grandmother had uh, really a great impact even in my calling unknown to me. It was only later on in life when um, I received the word of encouragement around about 18, around about 18, 17, 18, when I was really praying about what did I do in life? Did I go on and become a social worker? Or if I went on to ministry and I was in a service all night and these words were spoken of over me, you recall since you were younger, preached the word. And I couldn't wait to get home to tell my grandma what God had spoken that night. And my grandma said to me, I know son. And I'm thinking, Grandma, you were on the team last night, you could be a wee boy. <laughs> and then my grandma shared something that happened when I was a wee boy. So she sent me out to school one morning and she'd be praying for me. And I can still see her, she always knelt. She had three seniors to take. And my grandma was old fashioned. She always knelt at the end of the day and she prayed. And she said that morning that she thought the Lord just said to her, through your grandson, many will be one into the kingdom. So that's how she knew all those years, but never had shared that with me until God spoke to me um, in my life and all of those things. And thank the Lord that through our ministry um, over the years, by God's grace, um, we've had the pleasure to see people work into the kingdom of God and out of the kingdom of God because He chooses the weak things of the world to find the strong. Um, and um, so basically, um, we have. Um, we started ministry quite a journey, very young. Um, I think I went to Bible college when I was about 19. First church was 23. And um, in those days, we were all supposed to be put into a church of someone's assistant. I think you saw a mug in the front of my head. And I was sent off to Perth in Scotland, where Jordan was born, um, to pioneer work um, in those days. And we were there for eight years. Then we did some time in Newcastle County Down, Dromore County Down. And now we're back in Belfast, um, where it all began, quite close to where both Don and I um, lived and were brought up. Obviously, we have two boys, we have Jordan and our other son, Reuben. And when they left the nest a few, about 18 months ago, we decided, one, because of being at a conference one time where um, Home for Boo were speaking about looking after young people and caring for young people. Um, because we were sort of missing the boys from the house and really empty nesters at this stage, um, over the last 18 months we've had the privilege and the joy of having three young fellas different times stay in our home. We currently have one young man at the minute staying with us and we just hope and pray that we can still pass on something um, of love and care for somebody to give them a home um, um, while their parents can't do that. So that's a wee bit about my background. Okay, um, my story's um, a little bit different to that. I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. Um, I was brought up in a very loving home um, with a 
an older sister and brother. Um, so I'm the youngest. <clears throat> I was not a planned baby. And my brother was seven when I was born, so I was a wee bit of a shock. Um, but it is amazing, I was thinking about this last night, you know, how, how God works. And when you look back over your life, even over our kids' life, how God has woven um, and brought us paths and journeys that have us all where we are today. I have to say, I thought it was very brave of Jordan to ask his parents to come and speak on the parenting issue. Um, and also with Holly here, because I could tell you many a story <laughs> of many a night when I was screaming down the stairs at sleepovers. And Jordan! <laughs> Jordan! <laughs> do you know the gentle parenting you can do for so long? Jordan! Jordan! Holly! <laughs> um, you know, the, we had great fun, but you know, we'll come to that. But in, in my journey, um, I was um, brought up in home with three children. Um, and in some ways, because of the age gap, um, in some ways it felt like being an only child. My parents weren't Christians. Um, I was sent to Sunday school. They were the days when, you know, it was a good thing to send your children to church or to Sunday school, but you didn't necessarily have to go with them. So I was sent. Um, and I was also sent to a good news club. And the story about that, you know, how God works, because when we moved to the estate that we lived in, there was issues with the house that we were in. And, and my dad went to complain about things, so they moved us. And where they moved us to, four doors down, there was a family with a mother and a daughter who were both Christians and ran a good news club out of their house. So my mom was like, there you go. So I would go down four do doors down with my friend who lived behind us and we went to Good News Club and we were connected to the Presbyterian Church at the time and eventually the club grew and it had to move into the church and it was one night, after, one Friday night after Good News Club, I came home and I said to my mum, um, I decided tonight to follow Jesus. And I clearly remember her saying to me, that's lovely, <laughs> you know. And she remembered saying it because she, I remember, I know I shared with some of you recently she had dementia, but before that, she was able to tell me that she remembers that very night that I came home. So as an eight-year-old child, um, I was in a home with no Christian backup as such, but very supportive parents who didn't, didn't try to stop me going let me do my own thing. Um, and thankfully for me, maybe because I'm a very determined person, um, that <laughs> I, you know, I really, at that young age, and I think sometimes people think, well, do children really know what they were doing? I can't say that I maybe fully understood the decision that I made, but what I did know was, this is what I wanted. You know, I wanted a life following God, serving God, and I really felt that from a very young age. And it was later on through my friend that um, I ended up in her church and in the youth group with Stephen and, and what became a very close friendship group for us. Um, and, you know, we, we travelled those teenage years together, which for me was really important when I didn't have Christian parents that I had a church family and Christian friends to su support me through that because whatever generation we've been in, they're hard years. Every generation, you know, I know people say every generation it gets harder. I think they're possibly right, but whatever generation you come through, there was challenges that, you know, that we all had to face. Um, so it was there I met Stephen. Um, I had no intentions of going to Bible college. Um, when I said I wanted to serve God, being involved in pastoral ministry was not what I had in mind. Um, it was really more around children. Um, did a lot of work in my youth with CEF, went to the Good News Club camps, um, and had a wonderful, wonderful time through those years. And I look back to Sally and how instrumental in opening their home to children with the impact that that then had on my life. And I do remember, because I didn't grow up in a Christian home, I do remember always thinking, I want my kids growing up in the house of God. 
I want them to have that security, that stability, not just with us, but with the family of God around them. And so I don't know how many years, over 30 years later, and practically that where we started in terms of location for church because the church that we're in at this point is in a community centre behind the Presbyterian church that I started this journey on. So it's been uh, almost like a full life circle and um, back again. And that's just incredible. Sometimes when I pass that church that I remember that's this is where my, my journey with God started. And God really started to move um, in my family. <clears throat> and when I was in my teens, my mom became a Christian then my dad, then my sister and her husband, and I know my brother's here in a couple of weeks. He was the biggest worry in our lives, but I'm not to end his story. Um, and, you know, when he came to God, it really was a miracle, and he's now a pastor as well. So we we kind of came from um, nobody really being in church to um, a family of pastors. <laughs> Um, Stephen often says, some are plumbers, joiners, um, we're pastors. But as Stephen said, um, and Hannah and I were, were just um, chatting about their um, parenting stuff, um, because we've got these little lives that we have to help navigate to a certain time in our life. It's not easy, there's a lot of pressure on parents. Um, I work for an organisation called Home Start. There is one here in Perry, I'll just do a plug, they always need volunteers. If you're a parent, please help. Um, but I see the struggles day to day the families are under. I see cycles and where families haven't been parented well, how that impacts the children they have. And I also think there's a spiritual element to that, that when new Christians are being born again and they're coming into our spiritual homes, that how we navigate them and how we treat them and love on them or not actually impacts their spiritual journey and we'll maybe talk about that a little bit later as well. But I'm really passionate about families, I'm really passionate about parents having the tools that they need to support their kids and we won't always get it right. Uh, we won't always get it right but I believe that the Word of God where it says you know, he has set them in their families, um, in physical families and spiritual families. So that's that's where I am right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's get practical. Um, what are some principles for helping your kids grow to love God? And I know I know one of the explainers of this question was, you know, Sunday school is an hour a week at the end of the day, if even. So how do I help my child have their own relationship with Jesus? How do parents do? I think we have to do the work, don't we? And if you look in Deuteronomy 6 and 7, it talks about that these laws are written on our hearts. But we have to impress them on our children. That we have to talk to our children as we go in life, as we get up in the morning, as we put them to bed. And obviously when our children are smaller, we do that. We say our prayers with our children. We, we read the Bible stories to our children. We do all of those things. And our boys will tell you, you know, being a pastor home, you know, we didn't sit around for hours and hours for our food and sing Kim by Am the Lord. You know, we were a normal family. You know, we Well came. we did the Friday nights to be fair. That was bad. <laughs> well just once a month, you know, we'll probably the right action there, but you know, but we, we try to be you know, there's we should be naturally supernatural. You know, the things of God should be in a natural way within our family lives. And it was quite easy for us, I suppose, because we were not only a household of faith, but also a family and ministry. Um, but that looked like for us, I suppose, life lessons where we would be very open with our boys and talk about why we did what we did. And when circumstances come up in church life, we would explain why those things were. Um, and we would always look about how we conducted ourselves to be Christ-like people and that our attitudes of heart should always be like that of Jesus. So we were trying to teach our boys um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit by living that in our own lives as well. 
Um, so I think it, it always starts with God's word, doesn't it? It really does. It really just talking about it and making it natural within a home. It should be, if we're living for Jesus and living to be Christ-like, that should be our lives 24-7, not just when we come to church on Sunday morning, but when we, we are living in at home and living in such a way where we are living out <coughs> God's word in our lives and our, and our home. Yeah, uh, you know, my mom always said, children don't come with a manual. Um, wouldn't it be great if they did? Um, and, you know, they're not machines. You know, we can't really program them to be the way we want them to be as much as that would be lovely. Um, you know, we're all learning as parents, you know, on the job as we go. Um, but the Word of God, Stephen says, you know, gives us um, direction on how we do that. And, do you know, we, we all probably know that one of the best things that we can give a child is a sense of good routine in the family home. Um, we were having a conversation about this in work the other day and we were talking about, well I was talking about the difference between chaos and controlled chaos because some homes, you know, are very chaotic with no real control over it. But most of us day to day, like getting out of that school room is chaotic or getting them out to nursery or when they're coming home and there's dinner and there's homeworks. But to me, that's a, a, a form of controlled chaos. We know what's happening. Um, but those routines are really what sets a child up. You know, the, the good bedtime routine, the, the good school routine are so important, you know, in, in setting up um, some stability in their lives for the future. And, and I think if we see that as being important, then we can also introduce into our family lives family faith routines and rhythms that become part of our everyday routines. You know, it's, I think it's about making it the fabric of our everyday. And as Stephen said, it's not about, you know, we sit down at seven o'clock and we have a Bible study. It's not, you know, like that at all. It's just that day-to-day -day living, talking about God, talking about the stories and the accounts of the, the, the people of old and, and the things, the parables that Jesus told. Um, for me, it started, for me, it, it started right from when they were, they were in the womb. I would pray over them, I would talk to them, I would read scripture over them, because they're hearing us. From the very outset, they're hearing us and that positive impact you know, that, that's coming over, over their lives from the, the very start. And maybe you're here and you've, been, you've become a Christian later in life and your children are growing up. Um, and one thing I think we need to be very careful is parents carry enough guilt in life, don't we? We feel, especially, I will say this, especially moms, we feel guilty about everything, absolutely everything. And even if you've come to faith, later in your life, you can still model Jesus now, no matter what age your children are, your grandchildren, and that's just in your everyday life. Just showing them how you read the word, you spend time in prayer, and sometimes, especially if you have young children, that has to somehow fit through your day the best that works for you. I remember sitting on a Zoom one night during COVID and someone made a comment with the best will in the world that we need to be taking this certain time of day and we need to be spending it with God and that is so important. And they used the example of Jesus withdrawing or getting up early in the morning. And you know, some of us are morning people. Maybe some of us are evening people and that's the best, or really late at night people that you can take that time then. Or maybe if you're your mom and dad with toddlers or with children at school, that time is, can be found sitting. For me, it was very often in the car as I was driving, having, you know, pouring my heart out, having conversations. It's then knowing that you are finding some space in your life for God. I think that is a really important key. I think if we want our children to be passionate about love for God, and a passion for the house of God, we have to model that. 
So we're in dialogue with the house about oh, something not going to church today. Don't expect your kids to be passionate about the house of God, but if we are looking forward to Sunday as the best time of our week, and we're excited about getting to the house, and we're excited about meeting God's people, that will be above our children. And I suppose that, just to explain the, the terminology as well, we were, we were growing up calling God's house the church, which is called the house, or God's house, that was a lot of the, the terminology that we would use. Well, that's actually a good segue, actually, is um, one of those questions for you from maybe parents sitting here, um, how would you encourage them that actually God's house, the house, church, is an important place for everyone wants to be? Teenagers, whatever it is. Um, I think um, from the very beginning, of creation, God created us to be in family, to be in homes. The church is God's idea, and it is His way that He chose to connect humanity with Him. And when we, if we take a moment to really think about that, that is actually quite a huge responsibility. And the house of God to us as a family growing up was an extension of our own home. It's an extension of our own home. Um, that again, if we're building these things naturally into our family routines, our faith routines and rhythms, that becomes part of something that we do and that we are. And God has given us this spiritual home, this spiritual house, for a place that we can find love and support and prayer when we need it. Personally, I think the church, the house of God, should be the safest place on earth because it was God given to us to build spiritual family because he knew we were going to need it. He knew we were going to need other people. The way when he created Adam and he looked down and he thought, something's not quite right with this picture. He's on his own. I need to bring somebody along with him. And he created Eve. Personally, I think he created Eve because he knew Adam was just never going to manage on his own. <laughs> That's just my, my personal take. Um, you know, there's an old African saying, it takes a village. And it does take a village. And we, we live in a society where we no longer grow up beside our aunties and our uncles and our cousins. I had the wonderful privilege of a life like that. But many families don't. The world has moved on, families move for jobs and all sorts of things. And the church can be a place for that extended family. That spiritual family that we need when our kids are driving us insane, that we know there's somebody who's been further down the road that we can go to. And you know, for those of us who are further down the road, let's never forget what it was like when they were younger. Because we can't forget. And to come alongside parents who are still parenting babies and toddlers, and particularly teenagers. You know, when we come into those years where they're finding themselves, and they're finding their identities, and do you know what? The best place that our young people can be in those years is in the house of God. But if we haven't planted that in them from an early age, they may not want to be there. And here's the other thing, and we'll talk about this near the end. Some of us have done that, and our older kids don't want to be in the house of God. And we, um, and we will look at that. But also, Hebrews 10 tells us, don't forsake meeting together. And that's us, you know, as families. And when they're in church, they are watching, they are learning, they have got good role models. You know, when I look back, um, the role models in my boys' lives, um, in terms of Stephen and Amanda, their youth leaders, um, and even our friends, Cheryl and Paul Holly's parents, that we were, we were a family, and it strengthens us. I think when we bring our kids up in the house of God, then it strengthens 
as his family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, church, church matters, doesn't it? That how church matters, and um, hugely. What do you do when your kids don't want to go to church anymore? And I know you struggle to relate to that because we never suffer with that. Do we always want to put them joking, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> But so, yeah, so, so, I mean, we all went through yeah. phases, didn't we? Right? And your teens, you did, but to be honest with you, you know, um, it wasn't a big thing for us because our boys were so used to this is what their dad did, that's what we did on the Sunday, so it wasn't a, a, such a big issue um, for us. And you still have in your teenage years where, and today, you know, like we brought up two boys, and please hear this as we say this. We're people in full time ministry, we brought up our two boys the same way. But it comes down to persons of will at the end of the day. We have one boy serving God in the Lord's house, and we have another son who we dearly love, but has chosen a different path for his life. We love him with all our hearts. Um, he's not, uh, because he's not going to church, it's not a disappointment. He's not a disappointment to us, and yet we would still love to see him back in the house of God, and we pray that way. Why I'm saying this to you is this. You bring them up the same way, but there's no guarantees at the end of the day. No matter how good of a parent you are, or as good as a witness you're trying to be for the Lord Jesus, at the end of the day, there, there comes a point in their lives where they have to make that decision to follow Jesus for themselves. You can't be their salvation. They have to make that out on their own. Like I shared my testimony, when I was about 13, I really took my faith on for me and chose to pursue God um, for myself. And it's the same with your children. Now, we would have said in those wee moments in our household where the boys were we do I have to go to church. We would have had that conversation. And you just weren't bad that way, you know. Well, I don't remember unless I've got enough of these years something, but I don't really remember that you know, a real big issue. But we would have said to them, to watch your 18, you can make up your own decision, you know. And for you guys, if maybe um, you're quite a new Christian and you're trying to bring your place to church and they don't want to go to it when they're younger, it's grand in the sense of they have to be where you are legally. You know, and they can't leave them alone on their own. But when they get to that age where they're even older and they can't stay, you will know the maturity of your child. And what I would say to you is this, if it's becoming a war zone in your home to get your child out of the door on a Sunday morning, we need to then start to trust the power of the Holy Spirit over our children's lives. And I know there becomes fear in our hearts, but if they don't go to the church, they'll not hear the word of God, and uh, what's going to happen? We have to entrust our children to the Spirit of God, and we need to pray over their lives. Now, there is sort of a biblical stance here as well for us when it comes to, um, it's 1 Peter 1 and 3, and it's talking about a wife who is married to an unsaved man. And it's saying that in her life, her godly spirit should be a reflection to her husband, even without words, that he can see God in her. And I think we can learn that with our children as well. You know, if it comes to that place where it's a battle to get them out the door on a Sunday morning, sometimes that can do more harm. You get to church, you're not enjoying the meeting because you're thinking about what was said before you come out the door, and you're just sitting and your, your insides are going, and it's just not nice. We need to entrust our children to the Holy Spirit of God. It is heaven that saves, it is not us. We can bring them up in the way that they should go, but then we have to hand it over to the Holy Spirit as well and believe that God can do the work within them. But all the time in our home, we should still be showing the love of God, not just to be a Christian on Sunday morning, but Monday to Saturday, that we're living that life out and speaking positive words over, praying, encouraging the things of God. When things come up, as we started this conversation earlier on, you know, it is a life lesson. You know, I even remember like things like when the boys were going to do an exam, where I would be saying to the boys, we were praying for you today, but before you start that paper, bow your head and just say, Lord, I know the work I've done for this. Now you can't only start me helping to do this exam. All the life lessons where you're encouraging your children to ask the Lord to come and help them, and that they know you're constantly praying for them. 
Um, and because they maybe don't come to the house of God with you, just don't leave it there. You know, do pray for them, but do ask them in special occasions there. You know, Christmas, Easter, all those things. If you are doing something, you know, keep on asking, keep inviting them to come. But if it's going to be a war zone, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to do a work where He will speak, where your voice will not. You know, so you just need to be able to, to hand your time over. But keep having the hope, which we'll talk about a bit later on, that God is still able to do work in but it, it is important. It is important that they say it matters to us, that the house of God matters to us, um, and that there and it is such an important part part of their lives. And really encourage them to get involved. Really encourage them to. We did, you know, um, and I think too, even as a church. And we'll talk a wee bit this about you, you know, in a minute or two. But you know, um, let make children and young people realise that they are as important as anyone else in the house of God. And um, they're important to God. They're important to us. Uh, and I think when they feel they belong, then you know they will want to be there too. Make it a great place to be. Yeah. Make it a really good place to be. And I remember there was times where, because I've shared this with the church before, where there was a time, and um, where you guys were firm about being in God's house, not that the big effort came over, well, <laughs> not that it didn't always become a war zone, but, but I remember Ruben and I used to have this thing, we used to try that if we slept in long enough, they would just leave us alone. <laughs> they never did. They never, Jack! Yeah. Yeah. And then you pick it up. And then you go, and I remember this, I think this is a great example, though, there's a reason I'm sharing this, is when we, we moved to Newcastle, I was really into football, and I came to that age where you started to play football for like a wee team, and uh, when my dad found out, he was talking to the manager that I was eight at the time, <laughs> when he found out that the under 10s football was on a Sunday, I got put into the under 12s football on a Saturday, so here was this wee fella running around, I haven't grown much since, with all these 12 year olds getting booted on the Saturday morning, not planning to be in the age group, because why? Because the church was a priority. And I've shared this with the church before, but that I look back on it, and I'm glad actually that there were sacrifices made. I was explained, no, actually we do this on a Sunday morning, no matter what, because years later you actually look back and you go, oh, you're actually trying to plant us in God's house, and if you want to be planted and grow roots, then you have to hang about long enough for that to happen. Absolutely. Even if they get kicked on a Saturday, but that's, that's, not, that's not the point. Um, I was so young at the time, 10 under 12 football, we were standing in a circle and we were getting beat as usual. And the manager goes, I just need to put on your socks, and what did eight year old me do? <laughs> the guy was like, not literally, son, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, you look back on it and, and you're appreciative of those moments. So, with time, we'll maybe do these quick fires. So, um, mom and dad, how can Christian parents deal with the why can't I questions that maybe their kids had and, and that Ruben and I had? So, you know, why can't we go to this party? Why can't we watch this film? Why can't we, um, you know, go out and play football during church on a Sunday instead of being in church? All those sorts of, well, why can't they're doing it? Why can't I questions? But what are some practical ways that you can help parents with that? I think um, you know the football one was probably one that we were um, was a difficult one to be quite honest. And then when we moved to Jamor and Jordan was involved with the amateurs. Um, what I think is really important is that you're involved in your children's lives, um, and as far as possible, you know you know the people involved in their lives and their football coaches. And and I actually ended up being the safeguarding officer for the team for 10 years and we were we became really quite good friends with some of the, the other parents on the team so I think doing that helped us um, negotiate sometimes around timings of certain things but in terms of movies these days streaming, gaming um, you know why can't I watch that I don't know, 12, 15 moving, um, and my friends allowed to do it. And our, our heart to the boys and that was because we have a responsibility as your parents to check in what you're watching. Because if you're watching something that's older, your little mind can't always process that. 
And that can lead you into a place of fear and anxiety that we don't want you to be. We don't want you to be a place we don't want you to be. And it's up to us as parents, when our, our children are younger, to guide them and protect their minds. Because no one else is going to do it for them. And certainly the society we're living in isn't going to do it for them. And it, it's about protecting them. Um, because it's saying to them, we're responsible for you. I need to look after you. We need to make sure you're safe. And I know that today parents have got a huge battle with this because we live in such a digital world. Um, and I would say, protect your kids, use the passwords that the, the, the providers are offering, and do everything you can to, to protect your children. And will there be things that may get through? Possibly, but do it in a way that they know that they can still come to you if something has happened or they've watched something. Because what often can happen is if they have, it does play on their minds because their, their brains aren't developed enough to be able to process some of the, the information and images that are being, being thrown at them. And that is why sometimes that we have to say no to, to certain things. I think Jordan, you know, when we talked there about the football, uh, Jordan just loves football. And um, things have changed now. It used to be, um, if you're about my age and older, you would have lived in a society where a lot of stuff wasn't done on a Sunday morning. There was a respect for the people who went to their place of worship. Where to, today, I feel for younger parents because everything's done on a Sunday morning. And there can be, and I want to release you from this this morning, there can be this nearly sense of guilt that we can carry, that if we're not letting our kids do what the other kids are doing, somehow our kids are losing out. Can I say this, the best thing you can do is choose to teach your child to put the Lord first in everything. I want to say this this morning, even within Jordan's dream as a child, I'm sure he's been mentioned this before, like Jordan would at one point, as all we boys would do, well, most we boys, or even girls now today as well, you know, want to be the, the world's best footballer. It still happens. <laughs> <laughs> I like burst this but Gently. <laughs> you know, that there is that sense of, you know, um, you, are we holding something back from our children by not allowing them to be this or do this? Even if the remotest chance is that your child would become the best in their field in sport, which is a very difficult thing to become, they're still going to need to know how to navigate that life with the Spirit of God in them. And where do they get taught how to navigate life with the Spirit of God, one in the home and two in the church? And that's why we always need to try and negotiate with their children to teach them that this is the best thing that we can. Yes, there's compromises sometimes. There, there's times where, yes, there's something really important being done that we maybe need to allow our children to go to, but mostly they need to be here at the house of God. You teach them to put Jesus first in this, it'll help them throughout the, the, their lives. It's so, so important. Take that guilt off yourself that I'm not letting them be like their wee friends or not letting them, or they're missing out on something. The best thing we can give our children is security of relationship with God and being planted in the house of God. It's the best start we can give any child. So please take that off, that guilt thing. You're doing your best by getting them here to the house of the Lord. And it is challenging, there, there's no doubt about it, but I will share this, you know, Reuben isn't walking with God. <coughs> Um, chosen a very different path. But one thing he did say to us was this, I will never regret the way I was brought up. You know, he said, I won't regret. He said, being brought up in church and with the people that I've been brought up with, he said, I may not be choosing this life, but I will never regret the way I've been brought up. And I think that's quite significant when, you know, your adult child tell you, I don't want to do this anymore. But still, they recognise the benefit of the life that you have given them, and that, that's to me very key. Yeah. Okay. We'll do we'll do these these next couple of questions rapid fire, just with, with time going on. But um, Mum, for married couples, 
briefly, what are, what are some principles for raising kids together? I think it has to be literally that together, teamwork, um, agreeing on the boundaries, the disciplines and you know um, how you're going to do that and as, as they get older it really is um, because the negotiations with them become harder, you don't want to, the negotiations between yourselves to be just as difficult and um, you know, talk through what, what you want to do, what you want to happen um, because here's the thing, they're clever, they pay you off each other. You know, we all know that, you know. And as good as the two of them were, I have to say, you know, we were very I love blessed. You, Sally, uh, I love very blessed. Um, and then they play each other off. Mommy, mommy loves me more than you, you know, and all that sort of stuff. They, they, they do. still play up to they, they, they do. Fair, they do. I'll get, oh, will you talk to your favourite child? Now this is him. Or the prince, he calls them the first, first born, second favourite, that's what I said. It's not really <laughs> The rise and start, <laughs> um, and you know you may disagree with the decision that that your husband or partner has taken, and um, you know don't tell them as far as possible in front of the children. Have that conversation afterwards. Listen, was that the the best thing to do? And what I will say when we're making those decisions, or we're making, we're we're carrying out um, the threat of the consequences that we said. Um, Think it, think it through sometimes before you issue them, because sometimes it affects us more than them. <laughs> yeah, um, think about that. Use your strengths, each other. You know, use your strengths um, in the home to, um, to to raise your kids um, and, and do it together. Very much do it together because it doesn't work if you don't. Okay, and then let's let's look at the the other side of the coin there. Now, what about um, I'm just thinking of granny, like single parents um, who are trying to raise their kids in the faith. And um, what are what are some some brief principles that? Okay. Well, look, my advice isn't so much to that single parent, or to that lone parent who is we'll say the only in church because maybe their partner's not in church with them. My advice is to the rest of you looking out. Remember, we are a family. My mom knew by bringing us up in the house of God, where I didn't have a father at home, that I would find a father in church. We are now a fatherless generation. There are many children we brought up without a father at home. And if you're here today, men, we need to take this responsibility on. Thankfully, we do a good strengthening in every child, child protection um, classes. Um, and sometimes that can nearly put us off trying to nurture a child. But our children to come to church who are fatherless need dads and we need to step up. We need to be those dads. I can think back with great fondness of Ed, Eddie Hawthorne, who was my Bible class teacher, and I loved Eddie, and I knew Eddie loved me. And you know, I can remember even as a child, I really loved this man because he looked out for me, but you know, there was still times when I was paying my mum up, and I know you're looking at me thinking, oh, you'll never play your mum up with you. <laughs> you know, but I, all my mum had to say was, I'm an Eddie. And that was it. I had this revered for him. I really, really had this revered. But yet I still had this um, sense of knowing because he spoke so positively over me. He, he spoke love over me. He, you know, I can remember, you know, in all the churches that we've ever been in, that thankfully there have been churches that were warm and welcoming and hugging. You know, we're huggy people in all the churches we've always been in, we've been huggy churches. And I can remember as a young boy trying to get out that door, you couldn't get by, he, he just grabbed you and he put his arm around you and he said, I love you son, and he sent you on your way. I remember when I was baptised at 13, um, and you probably wouldn't get away with doing it today with all the child protection, but Eddie was holding my towel. And um, when I came out of the water, he was the one that threw the towel around, and he was so excited about me being baptised, and he was, you know, driving me so great, he kept up saying, I'm so proud of you son, I'm so proud of you son, at one point I thought I was going to go up between the tile, you know, because he was just so excited. And I would encourage you today, you know, men in the church, like, look out for those children in church life that are coming here without a dad. And appropriately, care and love for those families and encourage them that those children will know that there's a father's heart in church for them and that's often emulated through other men and, and sometimes women as mothers to maybe a, a child who doesn't have a mother. We need to step in there. Donna mentioned the start of the proverb earlier. It, it's an African proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. 
And we're all responsible to look out for each other and encourage each other's children in the things of God. Um, the Lord does set the solitary within a family and we're that wider family. So look out for each other and encourage each other. And especially even, you know, um, whether it's a one-parent family or it's just a young family and you don't set it around, you've been there, you've brought your, your guys, remember how hard it is. Don't be judgmental. Support them and love them. Do something to encourage them. And we'll talk a bit about that in another two today. Yeah, so what we'll, what we'll do is just with time, we'll move to the question on, on spiritual parenthood, because as we were saying, uh, for the church last week, uh, parenthood, the idea of parenthood, fatherhood, and motherhood goes beyond the biology of it. So here's the question. The Bible shows us places about the importance of something called spiritual parenthood. Talk to us about spiritual parenthood, fatherhood, motherhood. What is it and how do we do it? Again, let's go back to the word, isn't it? So Titus teaches us, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, Sound in faith and love and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husband and their children, to be self controlled and pure, physical, to be kind. So here we see within the church Timothy, that young minister, is being encouraged to teach the older men how to live, the older women how to live. But there's a family atmosphere here. Then the older men in the church have to teach the younger men how to do life in Jesus. So the younger women then have to teach the, or the older women to teach the younger women how to do life in Jesus to pass that knowledge on. And so we need to be looking out in church like that just to pass on how we did it and how we've experienced God and to be supportive. That's why I was saying earlier on, you know, if you see that we family struggling, don't talk and criticize that the wee ones are playing up in church and all that. Go and ask them to do one wee bit of help. You know, ask them, can you hold something for them? I believe what they're, they're saying to their children. Um, we need to be supportive one to the other and remember what it was like for us. But you know, I have a couple of examples in my time too about how women sold into my mother's life being a one-parent family. I remember way back going to a conference years ago um, over in um, the south of England, in a week's Bible conference, and um, the pastor's wife came, when it was the ladies' service in the afternoon, said to my mum, I'm Helen, away you go to the meeting, I'll look after Stephen for you. And I could treat it. I can remember going to the wee shop on the side, it was a Butlins holiday camp, and Mrs. Duncan taking me there and buying me a wee packet of cars, and I still remember her sitting outside her shelly door on the pad, playing with these cars where my mom was able to go get blessed in service. Why? Because Mrs. Duncan had been there and done that. I knew that my mom was a young Christian with no husband there to take her child, and then my mom go to that service. We had a great couple in our church, and uh, you know, even when I look back in my day as a child, they always look old. They probably weren't as old as they were, but they were older than my mom, and they were like a mom and dad to my and like grandparents to us. And do you know, I can still see me, Mrs. Morrow, on a Wednesday night coming up our food path with a, a block of um, ice cream under her arm, coming into the house and saying, Helen, you go to the prayer meeting, I look after the children. Why? So my mom could go on her feet. And it's that sacrifice that we need to be making as older saints for our younger, young families in the church to help them grow in God. And as a child, I haven't forgotten that. And I know I've never forgot that. And that's what it's about, inspiring and carrying each other on. For those that are older in faith, they've got so many prayer meetings they've got. And I know we all love to be in the house, but can we sacrifice once a month? to allow maybe a one-parent family to get their prayer meeting in our Bible study and let them flourish in their walk with God because that's so important. It's about that whole thing. It takes a village to raise a child. We're going to go to the last question here. But just before we do that, just really quickly, could you bullet point a couple of things for us guys about how everybody in the room today can be a spiritual parent and can play their part in raising another 
generation to love Jesus and carry on around. Just from the day of practical things in Buddha point. Um, I think it is a same say it's just about coming alongside someone and that it can be even you know, as generations we, we reach up and down, you know, so there's always someone ahead of us and there's always someone coming behind us. Um, and it's you know, making sure that our hands are, are stretching out both ways and cultivating a culture of honour across the generations and um, that we honour each other, that we're, we recognise that we're all part of the body of, of, of Christ and we're all important, we've all a part to play. You know, I look around today and it's an inter you have an amazing intergenerational church. Really, really look after that and protect that and show a heart of gratitude towards that and, you know, continue to help kids, we said this, feed them along. You know, help serve in some of those ministries of kids, of, of your tots, of your youth. Encourage their faith. Come alongside them. You know, when your young people are up here doing things and they step off this platform, encourage them. Tell them you're, you're praying for them. Support their parents. And lastly, I'll say this, support your kids and youth pastors and leaders because they need it. They need your prayers. They, they need your support. Really encourage them. And be thankful that you have them. Yeah. Be thankful that you have them. You know, young people, build them up yeah. and make this place the best place for them to be. And, and we all have prodigals in our lives. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a child, it's a parent, it's, it's a cousin, whoever it might be, a work colleague um, who wants to walk with Christ but don't any longer. How would you encourage that person who, like the father and the parable, are waiting for their prodigal to come back to Jesus? Or can you not come? Let's take, let's take five, okay? Folks, I could literally preach in this all day. This is one of my um, loves. I love, if I preach in the gospel, I love to preach on the story of the prodigal son, but I promise you it will be very, very quick. Um, Luke 15 and 20, from this one verse alone, we can really answer this question. And Luke 15 and 20 says this, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion, he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. What I'm going to say to you, if you have a prodigal, keep watching. Keep watching for their return. Keep living and preparing in faith for their return. Keep your eye on the road for them coming back. Those signs for them coming back. And if you've been taught to watch, you're also taught to pray. Honestly, keep praying for them. We sing a song in church, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Um, and when it comes to the bit about your family, calling out your family, I call out my son's name. I call out my sister's name, that the Lord would bring them back into the kingdom of God. Keep watching and praying for them. Secondly, have compassion. Don't have judgment in your heart and heart. Look, if they're a prodigal, they are going to be doing things that you're not used to. They're going to do things against what you have taught them to live their lives to. But don't greet them every time they share their story with you with harshness or rebuke. You need to show them compassion as the Father shows his children compassion. We need to have compassion for our children. Um, you know, if um, that doesn't mean to say we can do what they do, but we need to have, be always there to fix when they have made a mess of it, we need to be there to show that they can always come back and that we're there through the love of God to try and put things back into the right way that we are supposed to, or the way that it's supposed to be. I'm going to say this, get ready to run. Not from them, run to them. I love this part of the story when this Israeli gentleman lifts his garments and he runs. He broke with Epica. Israeli men of a certain age did not run and they certainly did not bury their legs. But when he saw his son, he gathered his garments and he ran towards them. And when you see your prodigal coming home and making those little motions that you know they are making that journey back to the Lord, run to them. Break with etiquette. Don't be thinking in your heart, well, such and such would do this, or such and such wouldn't do that in church, and such and such wouldn't meet them this way. Run towards them. Lift up your garments and run towards them with all your heart.
and the Father of Man. Um, I have the most loveliest, um, I will get emotional by the way, um, um, time with George was just to be about it. He probably doesn't even remember this. But I had been away on my first mission journey for, um, for 10 days, hadn't seen him for 10 days. I got back into the Belfast airport. I wish I could tell you the food story, it's quite funny. But you know, what part of it was that we were allowed to go into, um, we'd been upgraded into first class or business class, and all these men were sitting in their press steam suits and women going to business meetings. And me and my brother in law had been in Africa, we were travelling for 16 hours. I hadn't heard the plane even call us, he had to come running for us. And we were literally running last on, and we were screaming and we were dirty, we'd still muddle our boots from Africa and the sand and everything and there we were sitting with all these nice pristine people and we weren't the nicest looking but at this stage we got on the plane and we got home but when I came through the airport all I heard was this wee voice That's my dad That's my dad And this wee man was just a good car he was just heading for his dad and he was shouting, and even I think he was even, he even got through security because all <laughs> he was like, that's my dad, he hadn't seen me for 10 days. And church, if you were prodigal, be prepared to run towards him. Doesn't matter what other people think of you, we should be doing that, or that's good doing, you run towards him. If the Spirit of God puts it in your heart to run towards him, you run towards him and you grab them. It doesn't matter. That would be boy to come to his family and he wouldn't have had time to shower. He'd been in a pig thing that he shouldn't have been in as a young Jewish man. He had been stinking. And the father still ran and ran towards him. And here's another very significant thing and I'm going to stop. <laughs> it's like what was, the pastor says. One more point. <laughs> Three minutes later, you're still in church. I promise you I'll not do that. Here's the last thing. With this father, he ran, he put his arms around his body and kissed him. Now there's a big significance there, because in old Israeli law, in Deuteronomy 21, we can read this, that if your child was rebellious and did something on you, you could have that child taken to the square and the elders would have stoned him. Harsh, isn't that? But see this week, Ali, you're not going to touch me. You're not going to touch my boy. When your child has gone away from the Lord, they've been damaged to that. And they don't need anybody, mean well, mean well meaning Christians, saying negative things over them. You need to protect them. You need to put your arms around them and you need to let them know that the Father's heart's never changed towards them and that your heart's never changed towards them and that you still love them and you're praying for them. You need to give them protection. And that's what we learn from the story of the prodigal son. Maybe someday Jordan will let me preach that for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that's the story of the prodigal son. I'll just say, more than now, if I do get to preach that, bring plenty of haggies. Twenty first of July actually is, is the next one. Uh, folks, why don't we just put our hands together? It's the best one of the Church, we're going to pray. Maybe if you're able to, maybe you stand with me. I know we've, we've gone on, but I think that was more than, than, than worthy of listening to and leaning into this morning. What we're going to do is, we're going to, uh, Mum and Dad are going to pray over our whole house this morning, God's house, God's people. We're going to, then we're going to say our benediction. But before we do that, in the foyer this morning, um, there's four opportunities to sign up for things. The first is membership. If you've been attending Carrick for Carrick Mandarine for around a year and you would like to register your interest in what membership is, you're not sending your life away. Um, you can do that in the foyer on the way out. Baptism, I think with three or four signed up for that already, which is brilliant. If you'd like to be baptized and take that step of obedience with Jesus, you can sign up for that as well. The church here's two things, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, we're out of space in the crash. Isn't that brilliant? It, it's just we, we can't do it anymore. So we're gonna to need to move to a bigger space. And we're don't worry, we're not going to like to build a project for a crash, but we do we do need a, a bigger place. And so we're looking into that. But in order to do that, we need a team of people to make that happen. And so whether you're willing to make a cup of tea for a mum or hold a baby for a dad, we would love you to sign up. And all you're saying is, I'm registering my interest. You're not sending your life away, but you're saying, yes, I'll help out in a crash um, if we can get a fully staffed one sign up. And after what we've heard today, building the next generation, how important is that? They'll end their time and be a part of a crash team. The second is this church is a kids team. 
Um, we're hitting about 20 odd kids now. We're just t- nearly touching that uh, on a Sunday morning. We really need your help um, to make that happen. It is not volunteering, just to be clear. It is serving the next generation. And that's what we need as a church. We need men and women. And I'll be honest with you, church, we don't have one man on our kids' team. Not one. I think this morning that should change. So if you feel challenged by this morning, why don't we just register your interest to the Crest team or to the kids' team? And let's pull together as a team, as a church, and serve this next generation coming through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, well, on that, if you would pray over the church this morning, and then we'll say our benediction together. That would be great. Thank you. Father God, we just thank you that we have this house that we can come to. And God, I just pray this morning for your church here at Carrick Nazarene, for this family of God. Father, I pray that you will strengthen them. Father God, I pray that you will pour your grace and favour. And God, I thank you that as we stand here today, as parents or not, that you know the challenges that we face. You know the challenges our children and our young people face and you want to do it with us. That you have given us your word as a lamp to our feet. And God, I pray that as we lean into that, that we will dwell on your guidance, God. And Father, we will direct our children according to your word the best we can. And God, for those who like us this morning stand, knowing that they have children who are far away, no matter what age they are. God, I pray that you will lift any guilt of them this morning, that they will be released from guilt of feeling, it's my fault, I didn't do enough, I should have done this. That they will also be released from the judgment of others. God, God, release them from the judgment of others. And God, we assure them that today that you still see their child no matter where they are. The Father God, that you're the one that can bring something across their path. We can't do it for you, God, as much as we'd love to. We can't do it for you. But God, we will leave the light on. We will leave the light on that they can find their way home, both in our physical homes and in the spiritual home. There will always be a welcome home banner. God, I pray that you will strengthen these people today. Raise up strong generations that have come through this church before. May that continue. And what the enemy means for evil, God, we know he'll turn for good. The devil may think he has them, but Jesus, you say they're mine. They're yours, God, because we brought them to you. But God, the generations that are here, may they love each other, reach up and down to each other, and may they serve one another, come alongside, help each other, be the safest place in Carrick and let this community know that there's a place for them here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray with this church the prayer that I've prayed from the very inception of this point. But I pray for my people, I pray for this church now. Father, will you take the people of this church and make this year, this season, A season where they can find out how deep the Father's love really is for them. How much love they are. And that they will respond by falling in love with you again and again. And that depth of love would just go beyond all measure. But Lord, I also pray as they fall in love with you as a people, Lord, let them fall in love with each other. Make their bonds deep. May their heart for one another sincere. Lord, I pray the Father God that there will be such a family atmosphere birthed in this church. The Lord, teach people to trust 
themselves to one another. That Lord God, that they would know that they have each other's backs. That they would learn to be biblical and not gossip about each other. That they would always have good thoughts towards each other. That they would work their hearts for the best for one another. That this becomes the best house possible for everybody. Lord, take them on this journey of deep love for you and a deep love for each other and then everyone in this area will know that truly they are your disciples. So bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.